Well, hello, everybody, and welcome again to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on executive directors and nonprofit professionals and nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make positive impacts in their communities. I am your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Introduce Multimedia, and I would like to welcome a really good friend to the podcast. And she's also an executive director, or now co-director, Tejmika Torak of the Firecracker Foundation. How are you doing, Tejmika? I'm doing well. How are you? Well, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Starting off the year great. And uh, how we usually start off this show is by talking about what the mission of the organization is. So what is the mission of the Firecracker Foundation? Our mission is to honor the bravery of children who have experienced sexual violence by building a community invested in the healing of their whole being. And so with that, this is a, a nonprofit that you founded. I did in 2013. We'll be nine years old this, this year. It's it's amazing. It just time just zips right by. I mean, <laughs> it's like this is like like somebody else said on the podcast. This is like my 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 youngest child, or maybe even you know. And so, so what was the impetus to go out and start your own or found your own nonprofit organization? I discovered late in life that as someone who had survived sexual violence uh, myself, that the information that I needed in order to heal was not accessible to me. So I learned late in life what trauma was. I learned late in life what the impacts of trauma could be on someone's life. And so all of these issues and challenges that I had were actually symptoms of trauma. And so once I discovered that information through being connected with a therapist, I took some time to really think about what is it that young survivors like me need to be able to heal and have access to healing earlier in their life so they don't find themselves in their 30s just realizing the work that needs to be done. And how was the reception to this new organization when you first brought it to the world and said, here I am, this is the org, please support me in this really important work. How was the The reception? The community really, sorry, my child is like asking me questions. Uh, (laughs) The community embraced us with open arms, embraced me truly in the beginning. It was just me and I had shared my personal story and what my experiences were with violence. My father was my perpetrator and what it meant to go through life without the information about what trauma was and how it impacted me. And it really resonated with people. We often uh, think about the statistics as, you know, one in three girls and, and one in six boys will experience some form of sexual violence before they turn 18 as this sort of information that floats around us, but isn't necessarily connected to us. And what I found in sharing my story very early on and launching the Firecracker Foundation is that it started to put faces and names and relationships to the kind of harm that was happening mostly within our homes and and within our family relationships. And I think that a lot of people... Um, And I know that a lot of people shared with me, you know, I wish I would have had this when I was a kid, like what you're creating would have been so valuable to me. And because of that, people really invested not only their money, but their time and their energy in really supporting the mission of the organization, but also the growth of the organization's capacity over the past nine years. And how was it for you to finally to to lead this charge? I mean, 
just to get up every day. I mean, it's not like you don't have experience in working in nonprofit organizations. Um, but leading leading this charge, what were what were some of the things that you you're like, yeah, I'm ready to rock and roll with this. I'm getting some support, but what was like, oh my gosh, I didn't expect this. You know, I, I actually didn't have a lot of experience in nonprofit when I first started the organization. I had worked in a nonprofit for, it was my first job in a nonprofit for three years right before I founded the organization. What I discovered was that I had been a community organizer and a fundraiser my entire life. I just didn't know it was a profession. And when I got that job and I started doing what other people consider work, <laughs> Um, that is actually a professional career, I was sort of amazed by the fact that I had spent my life doing these things and no one had said to me that this is actually a thing that people go to college for, right? Or that people actually join the workforce wanting to be. And so when I started the foundation... I got to practice those skills and build on those skills that have really come instinctual, instinctually to me. And then it gave me the opportunity to really gather people who had skills that I didn't have naturally to not only help me learn what I needed to learn to run the organization, but also to build the capacity to, to make it possible for us to do more than I would have been able to do by myself. And so there were a lot of surprises. I often tell people that the reason I started the Firecracker Foundation in 2013 was really um, rooted in naivety. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely did not know what I was creating. I originally thought I was going to raise $6,000 and give six kids scholarships to go to therapy um, and that after that, if I was lucky enough to raise that amount of money, then maybe I would do it again. But I did not step into it with the idea that in nine years I would have staff and, you know, multiple services and programs and that I would be writing grants. And, you know, I just never came to it with that sort of ambition of, of what it was going to look like in the future. The most important thing to me when I started the organization is I knew that there were things that I had in my youth that helped me be well, like things that I had these wonderful women who came into my life at different periods who really coached me and loved on me. And as I like to say, they poured good things into me. I was a singer all the way from middle school till college. I did music. I did theater. I was a cheerleader. My mother was very supportive. Everyone um, that was important believed me when I disclosed what happened. So I had all of these like really rich benefits um, in my life that helped me be a person who managed and coped with the trauma and the consequences of trauma like PTSD and depression and anxiety um, in a way that was healthier than I would have been able to on my own if I didn't have those things. And then on the other side, I didn't have the information I need. I didn't even know what the word trigger meant. I didn't know how severe the trauma was that I experienced. I didn't know that there is a community of survivors in the world who are working on sexual violence and domestic violence. I was really not engaged in a community of survivors until after I started, or you know, right before I started the organization. So when I was, what was the most important to me was more about putting that formula together of what I had um, and what we know helps children recover from trauma and what I didn't have and how I could smush those things together and provide my community with what I would have wanted when I was a kid. And the only thing that, not the only thing, but one of the things that made that infinitely better is our ability to listen to other survivors and recognize that my formula is not the only formula that exists. 
And so what I didn't have and what I did have, uh, you know, add those things together is not what's going to work for every survivor. And so we have consistently listened to the survivors who are in community with us about what we can do to make the Firecracker Foundation a space of healing for as many people as possible. Now, going back to what you said right at the beginning of of this this statement that really described how your how your growth was over the over the years from starting, but at that starting point when you said that you went in with a sense of naivete, and you know, in talking with a couple other folks on this podcast, your name has propped up as as a mentor to them, and so. Who was your support system? Who 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 was there for you when you started um, and looked to and were like, uh, what am I doing? What do I do next? What did I get myself into? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, originally, my friend Kelly Voss, who I used to work for uh, and who had been uh, my director of development, was the person who I turned to a lot about especially board matters and fundraising. I'd never had a board before. My interaction with boards uh, prior to this was like organizing their coffee and bagels. You know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't get to participate in conversations that much. Um, or like the actual, you know, I provided, I, I shouldn't minimize, I provided reports as someone who fundraised, but I wasn't a part of board discussions or board management and relationship in the position that I was in. So Kelly definitely supported me a lot in the very beginning. I have to say, though, that, you know, I really trusted that what I needed to do, I could figure out. And so I often joke that Google is my lowest paid consultant. Um, I definitely benefited from belonging to a cohort um, through Just Beginnings Collaborative of survivors from across the country who are doing similar work. They were a huge support to me and, and still are. I turn to them regularly depending on what the issue is because it's, the, it's just so rich, like their experience. And a lot of them are independent uh, people who are working in this movement. So they're not necessarily running organizations. Some of them are, but many of them are people who are out in the world doing incredible work that is really rooted in, you know, Black feminism and liberation theory and um, disability justice and these really important and critical ideas that help me create uh, a space, like I said, that is healing for more people than just a few. Um, and just the people who are um, more, more often centered in the world. And so I feel really honored that people would see me as a mentor because I you know, I sometimes feel like I don't really know what I'm doing. And I know that that's not, <laughs> I know everybody feels like that sometimes. Um, but I feel really honored because when you have the ability to help someone foster and cultivate a dream that is essentially similar to mine, right? A lot of people that I have the fortune of being in relationship with are trying to create what they needed when they were a kid. And so really what we're all harnessing is wisdom that comes from our lived experience. And I might know a few, um, I'd be, I might be able to throw a few stones um, to get them closer to across the river that they're trying to cross. But I feel like I learn as much from the people who probably claim me as a mentor than, you know, that they do from me because we're on the same path. We just have different stones in our pockets, you know. Exactly. Exactly. So what do you think um, during this time where you were the director, uh, what was your proudest moment? I think my proudest moment is always. Um, when I have a youth that we have worked with and they are 
coming out on the other side of what was a really terrible chapter in their life. And, and that means, you know, they, beyond being hurt, but the healing process and what might be a criminal legal process and what might be a Title IX advocacy case or what might be, you know, families trying to advocate for better care for their kids. But when they get to the other side and they're able to say, you know, I really didn't think I was going to survive this. Like I I legit thought that I was going to die. I thought that I was going to complete suicide. I thought that I was never going to be able to function in society um, because of my depression, because of, you know, how my anxiety that, that are kind of came from this experience of violence and to see you blossom and come out and say to me, like, thank you so much. This was everything that I needed. And I am better because of it will always be my proudest moment. Um, Because you just, there's no way for me um, to be able to wrap my arms around the depth of that achievement. Like, because when you are healing trauma, you are healing relationship rupture you are healing the future because it's not just about healing from what happened in the past. It's also about the way that that healing impacts the future of not just an individual child, but a family and a community. Um, And so some days I just am sort of speechless and frozen because it feels so big. I, I, don't even know how to wrap my head around it some days. <laughs> I just feel really honored and blessed that I get to be a part of, you know, fostering that kind of transformation in, in people's lives. And what do you think that um, going along, along with that, uh, what, what do you think was your, What, what what do you think you struggled with, you know, starting out and, and going, um, being the director? What was the, what was your biggest struggle? I think my biggest struggle being the director is number one, solitary leadership is a trap. Um, you can never be everything that people need you to be. And you don't necessarily have um, the ability to be as transparent or ask for the kind of support that you need because the people around you want you to know all the answers. And I feel like in many ways, I dodged that bullet sometimes because I was able to cultivate a community where even though I didn't have other directors like I do now, I really do believe in shared leadership. So I've never been someone who really leans into like, I'm the boss and I, what I say goes and whatever. Um, I am the final decision maker or I was, and that can be important because I'm also holding the bulk of the risk. Right. So there's a reason why I'm, I'm the person making those decisions. Um, But I, I think that that is something that I definitely struggled with. And I also feel like it's really challenging to do work around violence when people try to isolate isolate it to one issue. So it's really easy for people to say, I absolutely do not agree with child sexual abuse. Like that's an easy statement. Most people will say, I don't think that children should be abused in any way. What many people can't agree with, though, that is really challenging in this work is that um, when you start talking about how Black girls are six times more likely to experience child sexual abuse, and so we should center some of our work, most of our work around them, most people can't agree with that. When I say that people with disabilities experience child sexual abuse six times more than their counterparts, and we should really be more focused on supporting those people... Not everybody agrees with that. Um, And when I say that Black trans women are experiencing more violence than anybody on the face of this planet right now, um, and we should center our work around that, and we should all be doing our work to 
disrupt any bias that we have towards them, people get really mad. And so when I think about the things that are the most challenging about working on an issue like child sexual abuse every day, it's that people only want to save the survivors that they like the most. And if they don't feel comfortable with the the survivors that we're talking about, they get really angry and they attack us. And um, I 100% stand by the fact that if we don't end child sexual abuse in every space, and that includes the the fact that uh, rape and sexual assault and child sexual abuse happen in prisons and deportation facilities um, and mental health spaces, um, institutions, if we don't disrupt it for people who some people consider throwaways that we don't care about, then we are ultimately saying that it's okay for people to um, sexually abuse some people, but not others, which then means that we're allowing perpetrators to exist and do harm. And they're not just harming the people we don't like. (laughs) Um, or the people that we have decided as a, as a culture and a community that we don't care about. Mm. So I think that's really the hardest part. And that's the part that breaks my heart the most every day is that I can't always convince people that those things matter, that when we're talking about race and class, and when we're talking about mental health and disability, that there are people who are being harmed that people in this country don't care about. And so I think that's why I go so hard when I am talking to people about those things, um, because I feel like I have to go 10 times harder because our country is going to do its best to maintain their ability to do harm to people that they don't care about. Well said. Well said. And now with that, you you know, going back to when you start, when you were talking about um, being it, being a solo director, Mm -hmm. you've actually taken that step and added a couple of co-directors. Yes. In the system. So number one, how did you find who's going to fit those roles? How did you, how did you, I mean, how was that process? You know, it really started with, um, number one, just acknowledging that I really needed to shift out of the the singular leader model. Um, I didn't want that. I'd never wanted it. You know, as I said, I was really, really believed in shared leadership. And so it was a perspective shift. And I also went to my board and said, at some point, it is not good for a single person to run an organization for the rest of their life, right? We know in nonprofit world that um, there is a thing called founder syndrome. And I have been aware of it since day one. Mm -hmm. And I've always been really clear that I don't want to do this work for the rest of my life in this particular kind of way. And so that was really step one. And then when I um, recruited Tara Scott Miller, one of our co-directors to uh, uh, run the Sisters in Strength program, we started having conversations about, you know, really, she actually sat me down one day after I was really exhausted. um, And I came back from a break and um, jumped right back into work. And she knew that I didn't have the capacity to jump back in, but I did it anyway, because that's what I do. I, I am accountable and responsible. So I did it. And she said, what am I here for? And I realized in that moment, you know, in her challenge, like, why aren't you using me is essentially what she's asking, right? Like, what am I here for? You recruited me and you're not allowing us to support you. And I realized at that moment that I actually had people on my team that I trusted, um, not just to do their job, but I trusted their perspective. I trusted their ability to learn um, and grow. And so that essentially I developed that from the inside of my team. And so Carolyn Abide, who had been our office manager um, and our operations person, and Tara, 
um, Scott Miller, who was our Sisters in Strength program director, were natural fits for uh, sharing leadership with me. And so after a period of discernment, which we're still in, I mean, we were going to hit a year as a co-directorship soonish, but time means nothing to me because I can never keep track of dates. Um, <laughs> Tara will tell me. Um, we're still learning and moving our way through it, but um, we decided that it was the best way to move forward. And for what it's worth, uh, there have been studies that show that in an organization that is focused on child sexual abuse, it disrupts the power dynamic that is the model of the family home where abuse happens. And so having more leaders where there can be more accountability and more transparency is actually disrupting power systems that we see in our culture where um, white supremacy can thrive. And, you know, all of this um, power and control dynamic where one person makes the decision, everybody else just has to bow down and do it. And so there was also that piece of it too. So with that, um, were you, was it easy for you guys to divide the responsibilities between each other? I mean, it, was it already delineated or was it one of those, I won't say arm wrestle moment, but I mean, how, how did you, I mean, you're the founder, you're bringing in these co-directors. How was this division? Yeah. How, how did you divide this out? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, what many people said to me right after the co-directorship announcement, um, and I love that you use the term arm wrestle because it gives me an opportunity to talk about how people thought that I was giving up power, mm. that I was like, I had been the leader and now I'm not going to have as much power within my organization. And that became a really clear indicator to me of number one, that I was moving in the right direction because that's what I did. I wanted shared leadership and the perspective that we have around executive directors or around the single leader is that they have all the power. Um, and it was just so interesting to me that people were scared for me, that I was losing power at my organization. Um, and I was like, no, <laughs> that's like literally what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to be the only person whose opinions matter. I'm not trying to be the person who has all the power. Um, we are about collective wisdom. And as I said earlier, like we need more survivors at the table. We need more people at the table so that we can create things that is more, create, create things that are more holistic and more valuable to the community because it's rooted in more lived experience than just mine. Um, and so, no, there was no like arm wrestling moment. We still haven't had any arm wrestling moments. I'll, I'll come back and let you know if, if that ever happens. <laughs> no, but we, um, we started out really with uh, a Venn diagram of like who was managing what. And it was mainly so that we could share with the board and with our staff, like how, who could go to who for what. Right. Because now there's these three people like, who do I talk to when I need when I get locked out of my email? Who do I talk to when there's my pay stub needs to be updated or who do I talk to? You know what I mean? So like there were just tangible things that we had to really uh, think about and give instructions to our um, wider community about how to interact with us. Um, but what has happened over time that cracks me up is we started out joking that we were like a jello mold, like a multicolored jello mold that's like this one's blue, this one's red, this one's pink. And like now it almost looks like a <clears throat> cosmic jello mold because as we started to really work together, um, there was so much overlap. And we started to really witness where. The work only gets better when we are able to work together on certain things. Now, of course, there's like, like I said, there's like menial, not menial is not the right word, but there's like administrative stuff. There's like just detail oriented stuff that we have to do in the everyday um, leadership of an organization, whether we like it or not. Right. And those things are a lot more clear and like clear cut. And those things get done separately. We don't really we do have our own roles within the co-directorship, um, but the overall visioning, the um, management of you know, HR, the uh, plans for how we're going to um, 
take on work and what services we want to provide. Like we do a lot of that visioning together and um, policies and the, the structure of the organization, all of those things, it has started to like really um, gel together and, and that we are three separate people clearly and very um, independent and thoughtful. And um, we also really make our work better. And I think if people are considering a co-directorship, I think that that would be the main selling point for me. Number one, I have no idea how I ran this organization as a single leader for seven years or seven and a half years, however long I did it. Like, I, I cannot believe the amount of decisions I had to make that I now have people to make them with me. Um, I just don't know how I did. I don't know how I did it. Um, so that's number one. Number two, the quality of our work has exponentially increased because we're doing it together. And I think that that only benefits the community that we serve. Amazing. Amazing. Tishmika, I can talk to you for hours. There's more stuff I wanted to touch on, but we have to close this this program. Maybe we'll have to have a, a follow-up segment at some point in the future and catch up. But um, thank you for being on the podcast. But for those who don't know you or don't know your organization, what's the best way for for people to connect with you? They can just go to our website. It's www.thefirecrackerfoundation.org and you can find all our social media and all of our information on that website to connect. Awesome. Well, and also thank you again for being able to take some time and uh, chat a little bit more in depth about the wonderful journey that is the Firecracker Foundation. It's been a joy to see it grow and to help play a part in the story a little bit, but man, uh, it just really, it amazes me every, every, every time I see you out there and seeing what's going on. But so thank you for taking some time to be here. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Paul, for inviting me. We appreciate you very much. And thank you all for, again, taking some time to listen to our program and don't miss the next episode coming out in a couple of weeks. If there's someone that you know of, or if you are a nonprofit professional and would like to have a segment on uh, mission control, then email us at missioncontrol at introduce.com. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and maybe give us a positive review. And so thank you again and see you next time in the control center. Have a good day. <laughs>